Here you go. It's your chance to bail out if you don't want to be recorded. Uh, Craig, I had a quick question before we started. Let me know. So there's um, two quizzes coming up. Yeah. Uh, there's one on Friday and one on, or yeah, sorry, one on su Saturday and one on Sunday. Okay. Are we going to be shifting those at all or are we doing those on those dates? Let's, let's have a look at them right now. So okay, sounds good. just to see where we're at. Uh, oh, Chamber, you're asking because they're shutting down D2L. Is that oh, why? Oh, no, I was just wondering because they're just back to back. So I thought we would move one or the other. Oh, I got you. Yeah. What's all this D2L shutting down stuff? They're supposed to shut it down at 4.30 today, and some people are saying that they're not going to open it back up till Sunday. Or uh, I don't know what time on Sunday, but it, it may be shut down till Sunday. Wait, what? Yeah, for maintenance or something like that. What yeah. about handing our projects in or doing our schoolwork? <laughs> Damn. Well, you have until 4.30. I have until 4.30 to do all my Mech 200 theory and drawings. <laughs> How's your Mech 200 project coming along? Oh, shoot. You're right. Up I am pretty satisfied with mine. I built oh, my I first attempt. And it, it did not work at all. And then I thought about it a bit more, changed my design, and it worked. Oh, very cool. So now I just got to make it better and better to see how far I can make it go. Yep. Well, it's cool because uh, this is the first time that, of course, we had to do it remotely, right? So I'm... I'm I'm excited to see how all the projects worked out. I'm going to see if Greg, is Greg Ball your teacher? Who, who's your instructor? Yeah, it's Greg. Greg, he's awesome. Yep. Yeah, Greg's uh, I, a lot of fun. Yeah, I'd like to, um, I'd like to be a fly on the wall when you guys are presenting. Is it going to be like uh, Zoom present presentations? No, we record it. Like we record a video of our project working or working. Yeah. And then we post it on YouTube, and then we share the link with him. Oh, but not everybody. I mean, we can make it public if we want. Yeah, we can share the link with you. I'd I'd like to. I'd be fine to. Oh, right space is D2L, well, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it says here on Brightspace, on, well, on the D2L page, it says uh, online systems will be undergoing maintenance this month, and limited outages will occur. Brightspace, November 27th. 4.30 p.m. Right. Uh, okay, so it's just today? Is that what yeah, you're reading? My sate is down until November 29, but I don't think we're using my sate. Gotcha. Cool. Sorry, uh, Levi, where did you read that? I went to the homepage. Um, on D2L and then there's like on the side there's like a little list of a whole bunch of announcements and stuff like that like okay. like right where all of your classes are if you go to my home if you scroll down a bit then one of them says online systems outage and then that's where it says all the stuff all right let's have a look at where we are right now we're quite a ways along when you look at our uh, the content part of this website. Um, right now we're floating around PLC programming. So the first PLC programming microcontroller fundamentals is due on the 29th. What is it, 27th today? 29th, so we're gonna have to get that quiz done pretty soon. Uh, and pneumatic controls, that's done tomorrow. So again, we've had a few weeks to get that done. So make sure you get your pneumatic controls done, your quiz five. Uh, the second PLC programming quiz isn't even opened up yet, looks like, but it's going to be due on December 6th, so we've got a few weeks there, and December 13th is going to be Robotics Fundamentals, so the very last class we'll be talking about industrial robots a little bit. Okay, and I don't think the, I don't think the quizzes themselves are going to be too mind-bendingly hard. Programmable Logic Controller Fundamentals, we'll just do a quick preview here. Oh, so we're talking 34 questions, most of them multiple choice. And 
each one shouldn't take more than <laughs> more than 15 or 20 seconds to do i think so yeah i don't know i think you guys can do it and if it is if it is shut down for whatever reason um we can we can talk about it then but it looks like um Pneumatic control is the one I'm most worried about. It's Quiz 5. I can see only 45 uh, folks have actually tried it out of the 100, 110 of you. So make sure you have a shot at pneumatic control. Get that one done as quick as you can. Is that okay? Yep, sounds good. All right. So today uh, we're going to be doing a little bit more PLCs. We started PLC programming uh, fundamentals last class night sort of talked about why we use industrial controllers, why, why they're chosen over, let's say, uh, desktop computers or, or single chip micro microcontrollers and things like that. And, and basically it came down, or, or why we don't just stick with relays. And it came down to the sophistication of the programs can be increased. They're much easier to troubleshoot, much more reliable. Uh, the PLCs are, are robust and, and uh, um, as I said before, something that you could use for traffic lights safely, you know, where you're putting people's lives in, at risk. So PLCs are certainly a much safer way of doing those kind of things. So uh, for industrial controllers, they're the bomb. And they've been, they've been working out great since the, about the mid 70s when PLC started to come online. But it did take a long time, you know, for a long time, uh, relay control was the way to do it because it was just the safest thing, safest approach. But now what we're going to talk about is how you program PLCs, uh, the way that they're programmed. And in order to understand the programming, we have to know a little bit about how PLCs are working inside. So um, the programming is not as difficult as the background theory behind it. But in order to get a really good grasp of why you do some of the things you do in the program, let's look inside the box. So this is the basics of PLC programming a slideshow that you guys have up on your screen. First thing we got to look at is the processor memory organization. Now, a PLC is a computer, just like just like your phone or your uh, or your laptop or your your tablet. All those things. It's a basic computer system, and has all the same elements of any computer. Um, first thing it has is some kind of a memory structure. Now, memory structures are are uh, the memory in the computer is how it stores all the program data all the program information all the data all of the setup information it's a control system um uh, or setup and configuration that's all stored in memory and there's two ba two ways of, of uh, dealing with memory and one of them is rack based now in rack based in rack based organization all the memory is based on where the where it sits in in the uh, card cage so you can see here we got uh, a card cage it's got four different four different cards on it and those cards would each have their own memory address okay. rack base isn't as popular as it used to be rack based uh where are we doing here oh there it is gotcha did it used to be really popular yep when it first came out that's why they decided to do it they, the input and output on the uh, computer system was based on where it was in the card slot. So the definition of the inputs and outputs, which was memory based, was, was a function of which card it was in, card one, two, three, or four, for okay. instance. And, and there's still a lot of PLCs out there that use that because they're old. And the thing about PLCs is once they're doing the job in a factory, people don't tear them out just because there's a newer, fancier, more sophisticated version out there. If they're doing their job, they leave them there. And these old PLCs were so robust that they're still doing fine. So you still see out in industry, a lot of ancient PLCs, 20, 20 years old or more, uh, just because if it ain't broke, don't, don't fix it. Now, the other way of handling the, uh, the memory-based system is using tag-based. And in tag-based, we get away from having to refer to uh, memory input outputs by the card that it's in and it just gives it a label each each memory input has its own tag right that defines it a lot more simple uh much easier to work with okay so there's two kinds of memory we have to worry about program files and program files are the files that are used for um, um the program itself you can see 
the program is, is where all that program information is kept. And, and data files are where all the information that the program is acting on is kept. So uh, ASCII text or numbers that are stored or analog values brought in or digital values brought in, they would be stored in the data files. The program files would store where your actual uh, programming algorithm is. Okay, so this is an old processor they're talking about on this, uh, this slide right here. This is called a, a SLIC 500, SLC uh, 500 from Alan Bradley, and it goes back a long ways. And so you can see how the memory is kind of broken out. There's an output image, input image, uh, the status, there's uh, the timers, counters, controls, integers, all different memory areas. So all the, uh, the memory is broken down into sort of units, right? So data files have all your inputs and outputs. And What's that? So data files have all your inputs and outputs and program files have what again? Well, all this, all this, uh, the program files are basically the program itself. So when you write code, it has to be stored in memory. Okay, and that's what the program files are. And you can see the program files right there. So and the there's program your files and your data code. files. The program files store code. Uh, program files store the code. That's right. The actual program that's executing. So the program files are the areas of, of the memory, memory, as it says here, where the logic programming is stored. So when you write a program like this on your PLC, that's stored in the program files. Uh, data files, when you have inputs and outputs and, and, and control registers and bits and everything like that, that really isn't a program. It's more of a scratch pad, more information. Uh, that would be stored in, in data files. You can see here, there's a, an output table that's got a lot of binary values stored in it, and there's a counter table that's got information about the counters or the timers or all the other elements of a PLC. Uh, they all get put into the data files. Now, every, every input and output in, uh, in a PLC is either stored as a slot-based uh, memory system or a tag-based memory system. And here you can see uh, a, an example of a slot-based memory system used in the slick line of PLC processors, where every, every byte, uh, every piece of information like this number two right here, this number two is stored as, it's number two uh, in slot number one on the input card, right? So I refers to the fact that it's an input, on the input card, uh, one refers to the slot that it's in. It's in slot number one, and it's card number two. So slot number one is right there. So somewhere in this area would be the, uh, the input, input two, right? And you can see the output down there a little lower. That output is the same thing. You can see this output here. It's stored into slot number two. There's slot number two, so slot number two is an output. And in that slot, it's on bit number 11. On bit number 11. So that's an example of a, a, of a slot-based uh, memory addressing system. So you can see uh, when we're working with the simulation, this is, a, this is the program called Logix Pro that I recommended you guys download last week. With Logic Pro, you can do all the PLC uh, uh, coding and downloading and testing and things like that. So you can see here, you have a bunch of I.O. cards or I.O. slots that are available. So here we see I1, so it's input uh, card one, output card two, okay? And again, here's the house, here's the memory organization uh, for all of the all of the data in the system. There's the output files, the input files, uh, the status whether the processor is running or halted or, or reset or whatever. Uh, binary files, timer files. Again, they're all broken down into into blocks in this chunk of memory. And here we can see the address range starting from zero, going all the way to the the largest number here. Uh, F8, 
and you notice it says uh, F8 and C5 and, and uh, such a thing. Well, it's, it's hexadecimal. All right. So again, the PLC5 is describing here that the data that you want to specify is, is shown by the address of the actual data. So you can see uh, here's, a, here's a, a table called an input table that you can look at. And that input table shows you all of the bits at the different address. So you see I0 right here, that's input card 0. And input card 0 has got these 16 bits, 0 through 15, which all happen to be 0 at this time. And at the bottom here, we can see input card four, which is all, all 16 bits here are zero. So using these tables, which are a way of looking at the memory, I can look at, at the actual input bits on the system. Now this table right here, this is an output table, and this is showing you an, an area of memory too, which is our outputs. So I'll put output zero, there's our 16 bits for output zero. And there's output four. There's our 16 bits for output four, all locations. So very often when we're looking at PLCs, we look at tables, okay? And, and the tables will show us the contents of that memory that we're, trying to, that we're trying to control. There's other tables out there as well for looking at memory besides the input tables and the output tables. Uh, there's the status table right here in the status table it gives you all kinds of information about the processor itself. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about status later on, but this is the information of the status table. This is a bit data file. So this is a bit of, of memory, like RAM. Okay, this is a bit of storage memory that you can use in your PLC and it's stored in the bit data or the binary table right here. There's our binary table. And binary tables, they usually start with a B for binary. Uh, the, in, the status tables usually start with an S for status. These are the timer tables. And now you guys have, uh, have on delay timers and off delay timers that you used in your, uh, when you're wiring things up. And those timers were handy for certain things. Well, there's timers inside the PLC that are exactly the same. And the difference is you have hundreds of them, right? This, you can use hundreds of timers. The timers, and this is the timer table, the timers all start with the letter T. So we can tell it's a timer by, uh, by the letter T. And there's the counter. You, wanna, you have a little counter box on your electro, electrical modules where you can count up and count down. Well, here's a counter table. And the counter table shows you the counters, which all start with C um, inside the PLC. And again, there's hundreds of counters. You don't have to have one counter, you have dozens and dozens, more than you'll ever need. All right, so lots and lots of counters. Uh, this is an integer. If you, if you want to store an integer value, which is eight bits, right? If you want to store an eight bit number for whatever reason in memory, you can store them in the integer table. Uh, they don't start with an I for integer, because I is used for something else. They start with N for integer, I guess. N integer. So this integer, this integer table that you look at integers in starts with the letter N. And the floating point file is for larger numbers, 32-bit, 64-bit numbers that are, are bigger than integers. Integers can't have decimal points. Like you can't have 3.14 as an integer. 3.14 is called a floating number. It's a much larger, a larger value stored in memory. An integer would be three, two, or seven, or 150. Those are integers. But 150.657, that's a float. It's called a floating, floating point number. Okay? And you want to store floating point numbers? You put them in this floating point table right here. So those are the tables, and just for just for giggles, let me bring up Logics Pro. So and I'm just going to close this screen right down here, and you can see all of the tables on the on the left side of this thing. There's the output table right here. 
There's your input table right there, your status table, your binary table, uh, your timer table, counter table, control table, the integer, and the float. So all those tables that you were talking about before are right here in Logix Pro. Now this, uh, this particular interface, Logix Pro, is almost identical to the, the uh, MicroLogix operating system you're gonna be using when you're programming your PLCs. So this is a great program to have. All right, so let's, let's look at two tables, probably the most important two tables in your PLC, the input table and the output table, okay? Because the input table and output table are the ones that actually define what your PLC is doing. So the input table, uh, the input table is allocated to storing the on and off status of connected discrete inputs. A discrete input is an input that is either one or zero. It's only got two values. So discrete inputs are by far the most common inputs and outputs of a PLC. Because you can put a switch or a, a lamp or a buzzer or a limit switch onto an input, okay? If the input is on, if the input is on at a certain pin, then the memory location is set to a one. If the input is off, the memory location is set to a zero. Now on can be any value that the input card supports. It could be five volts, 24 volts, 12 volts, 120 volts, whatever is considered to be on, it's irrelevant. They're always stored as a one in your PLC and the, op and the uh, a logic low is always stored as a zero in the PLC. Is that it, for every PLC? Yep. If it's a every the PLC. The ones that use hexa? What's that? What about the ones that use hexadecimal? Well, that, that, we're talking discrete inputs. We're talking discrete inputs. So if you want oh, to okay. store in a, a byte or a word, if you want to store in a temperature value, for instance, which is an analog value, let's say 21 degrees centigrade, that would, be, that, that would go into an analog input, right? And then get converted to a number. Then you can store it. And you can look at that number in hexadecimal or, or uh, in binary or decimal or octal, okay. whatever you want to look at it in, right? But right now we're playing discrete. We're just playing ones and zeros. Okay. Okay. So here we have an input, uh, input table right here, uh, which has the on off status of, of these discrete inputs. So you can see here, uh, we have a couple switches hooked up to a couple of inputs. One of them's off, one of them's on. And you can see that off input is showing up in memory on the input memory table as a zero. And the on is showing up in the input memory table as a one, right? So, and, and you can see, I've just, I've just hooked my switches up to a, to a power supply and I'm either passing the power, let's say 24 volts into the, into the pin or not supplying it into the pin. Okay, so all we're trying to see here is that the input image, the memory at the input image is storing a one for a high and zero for a low. If you have a discrete card like this one. Where are we here? Come on. Okay, so here's a simulated operation of the input image uh, for yawn off status. So again, you can see the input image uh, is, is putting a zero wherever there's a, wherever it's turned off and a one wherever it's turned on. And this is sort of how it looks on the actual, actual input table. There's the one you can actually see. So you can see one is turned on here in my little simulation. And so we have a one showing up on our input table. Let me go back to Logix Pro and see if I can hammer that point down. So uh, I'm going to go to my input table right here. And let's have a look at the I.O. simulator. Craig? Yes, sir. When we download Logix Pro, will it be possible yeah. to not have all the weird little transition sound effects going? 
<laughs> yes, they bother you. Yep, those yeah. go back to the uh, yeah. go back to the old paperclip days of Microsoft uh, ninety. We're, I don't don't office expect 97. It. Have to be off guard every single time. Yep. Yeah. You got to love those sound effects. It really makes the thing seem professional, doesn't it? There we go here. To do, 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 do. All right, let's just move on. This is taking too long. All right, back to um, back to the input table. Output tables are the same thing. When you want to turn on a thing, you want to turn on a lamp or turn on a control relay, turn on a motor or anything like that, uh, we use the output table. So any data stored in the output table, if it's a one, would turn on that related output. So we can see here, uh, this particular screw here in the bottom is hooked up to the uh, one, two, three, four, the fifth bit down, right? And when it's a one, that lamp will be turned on. If it's a zero, that lamp is turned off, okay? So the memory location assigned to those pins reflects how those pins are going to be treated by the PLC, either turned on or off. And like I said before, on could mean many things. On could mean five volts, 12 volts, 24 volts, 120 volts, 240 volts, whatever the PLC output card is set up to control. And there we can see in Logix Pro an example of the output table. And you can see pin four right here is pin four of output card number two. Output card number two, pin four is turned on. And there you can see one, two, three, four. There's my fourth screw down, that's output four, and it's turned on. And output zero is turned, this output uh, one is turned off. Okay, that kind of makes sense. So typically, uh, when you have a small PLC like this guy right here, you have, you have a fixed number of input and output. So all the inputs on this PLC are hooked up to, are hooked up to the top, right? So this, these are all the inputs and we can see it's pretty much fixed at zero, one, two, three, four, five. As I said last week, five inputs, right? Which go to input table. On the bottom, we have a number of outputs, right? And the outputs we have, hmm, zero, one, two, three, we have, we have three outputs on there. And that's pretty much it. That's all you can do on this particular basic module. Other PLCs, of course, have more. Um, here's a, this is the PLC you guys are gonna be working with in the lab. This is, a, this is a Micrologix 1500. And you can see across the top here, a whole bunch of inputs, right? This, and it, it can change, but this one's got zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. So we have 11 inputs across the top and we have a, a bunch of inputs across the bottom. Nine, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. Well, we got 11 from, well, from zero to 11. I guess that's 12. We have 12 outputs on the bottom and zero to 11, 12 inputs on the top, right? Outputs in the bottom. And in addition to that, We've got a little expansion card that plugs on the side. This is, a, this is an add-on card right here. And we got a whole bunch more inputs and outputs on there, right? So this guy can handle a whole bunch of inputs and outputs. Here's another one. This PLC right here, you can see banks and banks of inputs and outputs on this one. Okay. All kinds of. I mean, some of these, some of these are actual uh, analog as well. They're not all digital. Some of them are actually able to hold an analog value, zero to five volts, zero to twenty-four volts, or whatever. But when you look at the, uh, the PLCs, the PLCs have a fixed number of inputs and outputs, as it says right here. This one's got twenty inputs uh, and uh, twelve outputs on that particular PLC. So. Craig, just out of curiosity, 
on a PLC controlling like a factor or something like that, how many yeah. inputs and outputs would that have? Depends on what it's controlling. Depends on how big the factory is, right? So uh, it, it really depends on how much you want. Usually the cards, if you have a large system like a, like a MicroLogix 5000 or ControlLogix 5000, each card can have usually 16 inputs and outputs, maybe 32 in a card, but you can keep plugging cards in until you've met all the needs, right? But if you're doing something like the garage door, we only had a few inputs. We had an open button, a close button. Uh, we had a limit switch for open, limit switch closed. We had a stop button. So we had five, five inputs that I can think of. So why have a 64-bit input card when I only need five inputs. And for outputs, well, there was a pilot light, a jar, there was an open light, a shut light, there was a motor up and a motor down. So really five outputs. So this little guy could almost do it. You know, this guy could almost do the garage door, no problem. Anyways, you can have a whole bunch of them. So let's talk more about how the program works inside the PLC before we get into actual programming itself. Uh, we talked briefly last week about something called the scan cycle, the program scan cycle. And this is uh, something we're gonna kind of reiterate over and over again, because it's so important. This is how the PLC really differs from how a, a standard microcontroller or microprocessor. Standard ones don't work on scan cycles. They just, they just bring in data, process it, and, and execute it pretty much all at the same time. PLCs work on a cyclical basis, like a, a force cycle engine. If you, uh, I don't know if anybody knows cars at all here, or the old internal combustion engine, but there's four cycles to how the engine works. The first cycle is it uh, pulls in the air fuel mixture. The second cycle is it, it, it compresses it and explodes it. Third cycle is it, ex it expands the uh, piston down, pushes the piston down with that explosion. And then uh, it's pushed back, exhausts the uh, exhaust material that's inside the thing, pushes it back, and then draws in another uh, bit of uh, fuel air mixture. So there's is four things going on. What's is that, that? A two stroke? Is that a two stroke that'll engine? Be a, that'd be a four stroke engine, right? Four stroke, two strokes just an in, intake, and then it outputs it and it combusts as it's outputting? That's right. Yeah. Okay. That's right. But, but a four-stroke engine has to go through those four cycles. This thing has to go through its four cycles too, which aren't quite the same. There's no explosions involved, right? Mm -hmm. Now, this one does have a housekeeping cycle added on here, which I see uh, they're, they're including a lot more, although it's really a very, very small part of it. The big cycle is the input, input scan. It sucks in all the data from the input cards. The program scan, it executes the program, the output, scan cycle is when it sends data out to the output card and then it does the house little bit of housekeeping changing its registers cleaning things up a little bit and then it goes back to the input scan again so just loops around these four uh, parts of the scan cycle over and over and over again so how fast does it do one scan cycle all the way through? And that depends on how powerful, well, a number of things actually, it depends on how powerful the system is. So if you've got a little guy like this, he's not too powerful, he's gonna take his time doing a scan cycle. It might take a thousandth of a second or maybe, maybe 500 microseconds to do one scan cycle, pretty slow. Faster PLCs can run faster, they can do the scan cycle faster. But the scan cycle also slows down with how many, car how many inputs it has and how many outputs it has. So if there's more memory to deal with, the scan cycle is gonna take a little longer. So it's a big system, is gonna have a, maybe a slower scan cycle because it's got so many inputs and outputs and the program could be large or the program could be small. If the program is tiny, that part of the scan cycle doesn't take long. If the program is huge, that part of the scan cycle can take a long time. So the microprocessor has more work to do if it's a bigger program. So um, lots of things affect how fast that scan cycle is. And the scan cycle affects how fast the processor can do its work. Now, so, 
for a garage door opener, it, any PLC will work because it's pretty slow. But here's a picture of uh, these bottles that are just racing by, just, just like a blur past the spilling station so quickly that if the PLC is scanning too slowly, it might not be able to operate uh, all the controls on this thing, right? So you have to kind of balance the speed of the system with the speed of what it is you're trying to control. Does that sort of make sense? The controller, it says here, has to react to that input signal. And if its, if it's scan cycle is too long and it can't react, uh, a couple bottles have gone past before the scan cycle repeats even once, you're going to miss those bottles and not act on them. Next thing you know, you're going to have Sprite all over the floor and broken bottles everywhere. All right. So that's what this slide is talking about. This, this slide is talking about the fact that you got to kind of make sure your PLC is up to the task of whatever it is you're trying to do. Okay, now there is a, um, in the status table, the memory table that looks at the status, there is a, uh, a summary of the scan time, right? So you can actually look at your PLCs and see what its scan time is. So it'll, it'll uh, it's a combination of, as I say, the speed of the controller, how big the program is, kind of instructions uh, that are in there, any conditions that are in your program that might slow it down, and the size of the memory. So all those things can affect scan time. And you can actually look at the scan time of your PLC to see how, how many microseconds it's taking to go through one scan. Okay. So PLCs generally take a few microseconds in order to do one cycle? That depends. Depends on the PLC. Okay. And if it's, a, if it's a gigantic program and a lot of uh, complications, it might take milliseconds, right? Forever. Okay, but still like half a second and you have a half a second and your PLC might as well be garbage. Well, yeah, I've never seen a scan cycle in the half second range, right? A millisecond would be pretty bad. So, okay, so that's scan time. So now we know that the PLCs have to operate in this cycle, and this cycle controls just how quick that PLC can operate. Here's kind of a summary of the things that go on during a scan cycle. This is another way of looking at it. So um, the first thing that happens is the PLC will uh, input the data, right? It's gonna look at all the data that's gonna be coming in in the data file. And then it's going to process the data inside there. It's going to change the output table. And then it's going to return the output to the PLC, to the, uh, to the uh, output cards to control the things it's working with, right? So it examines the data. This is the uh, picture of it examining the data, looking at the program instructions, deciding what it has to do based on those program instructions, and then send the input to the output card, or send the, send the results to the output card, okay? Four, four major cycles. Okay, again, here we go one more time. It's gonna read the input switch. Can you go back a slide for a second there? Yeah, I can. Yeah, just so you can see what they're doing. Can I move on, Levi? Yeah, I think so. All right, same thing again. Uh, here's my input device, which is hooked up to card three, bit number six. It's a, it's a normally closed push button switch. You can see right here. Uh, that changes a memory location. Input three, six is the label on that memory location, the address. That is read by a program, which has got a contact called input three, six right? That's going to control an output, uh, which is on card four, bit seven, right? Which is going to change a memory location, four bit seven, which will be transferred to an output, four bit seven, which will turn on a lamp. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of steps required to, to run a PLC program, all going on without you having to worry about it.
Okay, again, this is another way of looking at it. There's the input table right there, which is gonna affect the program. The program is gonna change the outputs, right? The outputs are gonna change the output image, which will be sent to the output card to control the things. Now, um, let me talk about the programs itself. The programs, as we already discussed, look a lot like uh, ladder diagrams, don't they? They've got, they've got uh, rails, they've got rungs, and they've got components that look like contacts. You can see the contacts over here. And they've got components that look like coils. The coils are the outputs. The contacts are the inputs, right? So you can see here, whatever, whatever bit that is, if it's high, if it's, if it's true, then it's going to turn on that coil, right? But how do, when it executes these, these instructions, uh, this is how it executes them. It starts just like you would when you're looking at a ladder diagram. It starts at the left side and works its way to the right. Then it does, then it goes down to the next instruction and does that one. Then it goes to the next one and does this one and that one and so on and so forth. So uh, it, it scans from top to bottom. So the first instruction, this first rung is done first. Second rung is done, third rung is done, fourth rung is done. Then it goes back up to the top, does it again, over and over again. So it scans in a vertical scanning order. Right. And this particular four rung program in this example is considered to be the whole program. It's only got four rungs on it, it's pretty simple. Got a little or operation going on there, got a little and operation going on above it, right? So um, these scan patterns will make a difference. And when you're actually programming, to make your program as efficient as possible, a real good PLC programmer understands the scanning pattern and will build his program to be as efficient as possible based on the scanning pattern. And we might talk more about that now. Certainly, if you go into the automation program, we will talk about it. We will look at a poorly written program and a well-written program doing the same thing and look at how fast the scan cycle is. One of them goes like a, like a scared rabbit and the other one is just plodding along, right? So good programming has its, has its rewards. So that's a little bit about um, PLC programming the scan cycle, how it works, why we try to make the programs as efficient as we can, how some PLCs are faster than other PLCs and some are, you know, cheap. Uh, you can assume that probably the less expensive PLCs aren't that fast, right? But you want to pay $20,000 for a PLC? It's fast. It's a good PLC. $20,000? Oh, at least. There are some PLCs in the back of the, um, uh, back of the uh, robotics lab where this card alone, that card, $20,000. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. How much is like the whole, like, how much would a big PLC that controls maybe like a, a building or like? Uh, okay, well, like a, a big, uh, a very like powerful a system. Car. Well, more expensive than my car, that's for sure, <laughs> right? The motor torsion right. is so high. But on the other hand, you can pick up something like this for a hundred bucks. Yeah. You know, or cheaper. And this might be all you need. If you're gonna, if you're gonna do a garage door opener, right? Uh, I wouldn't probably put, put in uh, comp Control Logic's 5000 series uh, PLC yeah. from Alan Bradley. Can you um, combine PLCs, like have the outputs of one PLC go into the inputs of Absolutely another? Absolutely, you can. You can, have, you can have PLCs distributed all over the place. You can have okay. a whole bunch of little PLCs controlling little elements and yeah. then talking to a big PLC someplace else saying, you know, what should I do? What should I do? This garage door, you want me to open it or close it, you know? So yeah. they can communicate with each other nowadays. Wow. So, yeah, absolutely. You can have control, like, controller area networks. They're like tiny little telekinesis or telepathic yeah. That's robot. right. <laughs> yeah, they can, they can communicate serially or through Ethernet or through wow. uh, Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or all kinds of yeah. ways. Because I saw, I was looking at some of the power slides and there was some a remote control box, which is like, it's the control for the PLC, but far away. Yep. Yeah. Oh. 
Yeah, I could log into one of the PLCs at C right now. I could bring up um, I could bring up the operating system, the programming language. I can I can monitor it. I can change it. You know, change the instructions, wow. download it, and get it, and test it out at C uh, from from my moon base here. <laughs> can you turn all the lights off? <laughs> <laughs> I could if it was a building automation control. So oh, my son went through automation, your course, yeah. and he's now working at, um, he's working in the uh, water treatment plant at Winnipeg, kind of managing the both sides of it, the clean and the not so clean water. Hmm. And because he's, because he's pretty much the guy there, they also kind of got him doing building automation too, since it's a PLC. So can you, yeah. can you play with our building automation a little bit? Sure, uh -huh. right, so you'll get in there and do that too. So a good PLC programmer is very popular. And you know, he, there, there's been times when he's been uh, on vacation, you know, in Vancouver Island or something like that, mm -hmm. and something breaks loose, right? Well, they, they call him up a big emergency. This particular output has died and the big pump's not working. Uh, we're screwed. What are we going to do? So he goes in there, does a couple tests. He opens up the laptop from where he is in the hotel, does a couple tests, sees which card died, and then, and then reroutes the signal to a second card, right? And then enables that one and then tests it, working great. Has some guy back in Winnipeg make sure it's actually functioning and wow. he's done, right? So you can That's do a cool. lot of stuff without being there because of communication. So I wanna to talk to you about languages now for PLCs, um, the programming language. Let me we'll take, a, take a little break. Yeah, it's not a very big step. Yeah, we're going to talk about the languages and then, and then we're going to uh, take a break and talk about programming a PLC. So there's lots of languages available for almost any computer, right? Um, PCs, microcontrollers, whatever. You can get a variety of different languages. Um, but basically, PLCs are the same. You can program them in lots of different ways. And it, when, if you take automation, uh, the automation stream here at say we're going to teach you at least four different ways of programming a PLCs ladder logic function block diagram sequential functions a blocks structured text all those different ways but basically they kind of break down into these two families uh, one of them is a textual language which is the one you usually see people typing on a keyboard an instruction line shows up on the screen you know that's like like Java or C or, or or Perl or Python or any of those guys. Those are text tools, right? Which include instruction lists, which is we see the lot, that a lot on PLCs, and structured text, which is another kind of a textual language on PLCs. Textual languages are nice because all you need is a little text screen and a keyboard and away you go, right? The other kind of graphical, the other kind of language you can have in a PLC is a graphical language. Graphical languages are like uh, the ladder diagram that you see and you've seen already. It's, it's their pictures. Or you can use function block diagrams, which are blocks flowing into other blocks. Um, very popular programming language. We used it in, in first robotics a lot. It's called LabVIEW, right? Uh, sequential function charts, another one. And these use graphical images to get the job done. So there's a lot of ways of programming PLCs by far. The most important, the most common way is ladder diagram, right? So if you look at 90% of the PLCs out there in industry when they're being programmed, it's in ladder diagrams. In spite of the fact that some of these other ones are way better for certain applications, dynamite, ladder diagrams are the dominant programming language in industry, okay? And that's what we're gonna focus on too, which is a good thing. Uh, Alberta is kind of neat as far as the industry goes because we get a lot of, well, <laughs> oil and gas, that sort of stuff, and, and energy resources, and those things are all programmed using PLCs. So you want to learn how to program and, and work in Alberta, PLCs were a dynamite way of, of doing that. Go to a job site like um, Indeed or something like that and look for PLC programmer and just see how many pop up. And then look for a microprocessor programmer and see how many of those jobs pop up. You can see that the PLCs are pretty popular out there. Okay, so this is what a ladder diagram looks like. Now this was, when you did your relays, 
this is how we how we did our diagrams, right? We had push buttons, we had limit switches, we had all the symbols that we use that represent the push the, uh, the switches, right? And then we had a coil. Uh, in a PLC, we don't have the symbols. We we lose we lose the symbols. We just look at them as contacts, right? Normally open or normally closed contacts, and we label them push buttons, and we label them control relays, and we label them limit switches, right? But only the contacts show up in a PLC software. How, how that button is actually turned on or off doesn't really matter whether it's a push button or a, a, lim, a selector switch or a limit switch or any of those kind of guys. It's just a discrete input, okay? So those are hardwired into? Yep. The PLCs? Yeah, these, these, okay. one, these one would, be, would be hardwired into the input card, and then they show up as memory location. So do you have to program those? Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, okay. Okay. You'd be programming those. Now, <laughs> another way of programming is this is the same, this is the same, uh, you could wire this thing up on the, EMSI trainers, you know, you could use your little wires and plug in all these things. You could make that circuit up at the top, a hardwired circuit. You could also program it using instruction list. And this is what the instruction list program would look like. Uh, you would you start the program with a start and you say PB1 and PB1 and CR1 or LS1, that's this part, and not CR2, that's that part, right? Uh, is outputted to soul, right, or solenoid, soul. So this bit of text right here is the same as your code. So you can use instruction list, and some guys prefer that, just because I could type that out in a second. With the graphical programming language, I got to be dragging and dropping and dragging and dropping and labeling and, you know, this, this instruction list, tick 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 done, right? So, um... That's another option for PLCs. Another option is function block diagrams. So has anybody ever worked with Lego Mindstorms, that old Lego programming language? Lego, like the toys? Yeah, like the toy, Mindstorm. Uh, is, is a robotics uh, microprocessor you can get for Lego. No, I have never worked with that. Yeah, well, that one I worked with them, but that's because I never went out and decided to buy them. But they do look interesting. Well, they programmed those in graphical blocks, right? So, um, to give you an example, when we talked about the AND gate and we use this symbol right here for an AND gate, and we use this symbol for an OR gate, like that. <coughs> Excuse me. This symbol is for an OR gate. Those are, those are blocks, functional blocks. So when I, when I took these guys and put them together like that into another AND gate, that is example, an example of a function block diagram. We're using images to represent the logical operations. Okay. So that's another kind of language, function block diagrams. Um, and here, here we can see two programs that are pretty much doing the same thing. The latter diagram shows two sensors, sensor one and sensor two, both have to be on in order to operate uh, the caution pilot light one, right? This one has to be on and that one has to be on before the caution light's turned on. And here's a example of the same instruction with function block diagrams. This is your Boolean and, Boolean and, and our two sensors are going in on the left side there and our output, which is our caution pilot light, is going out on the right side. So this is a function block diagram. Okay, really popular programming language. Okay, this is another kind of programming language we learn in PLCs, it's called SFCs, sequential function charts. Okay, and the SFC is similar to a flow chart as it says right here, um, except the blocks themselves flow from top to bottom, and then there's these things called transitions that move from one level to another. Sequential function charts are really, really neat when you want to program something that has a certain sequence, a certain flow, a 
of operations. This happens, and then this happens, and then this happens, or that happens based on a decision. So when you have a flow of things going on, sequential function charts are really a nice way of, of uh, representing them. Again, we're not going to be doing the sequential function charts. We're going to be talking about just um, uh, ladder logic. The last kind of language we're going to talk about that you can do with PLCs is structured text. And it's called a high level, high level language. Um, and you can see right here, if anybody's ever programmed in a language like uh, C or Java or whatever, you might recognize that where it says, if sensor one and sensor two, that's the top part of this, then turn on soul one. Else, or else, if sensor three and sensor four and not sensor five, which is the bottom part, then soul one. So you can see this set of instructions here is the same as that, but it's done in sort of a high level structured language technique using, using a text editor, right? So that's, that we call that structured text in PLCs. Another thing about these languages is you don't have to just choose one. Uh, you can have a program that has got uh, some structured text, some function block, some ladder logic, um, and some instruction lists, right? D different parts of it can be run in different kinds of languages, each one having its own strength, right? So you can, program them one one routine in all the different languages right just taking advantage of the strength of each one so those are the primary languages used in plcs and again ladder logic is going to be the one that we're working with ladder logic because it looks just like ladder diagrams that you guys have been doing for your schematics and that's also why plcs are so popular because a lot of the plcs you want to be a really good, popular PLC programmer, you might want to get your electrician's, electrician's ticket too. Because most PLCs are programmed by electricians who also wire up all the systems. So they'll wire in all of the motors and the controllers and all that stuff because they have their red seal, they can do that stuff. But they can also program a PLC, right? So uh, if, you got, if any of you guys have an electrician's ticket and you're a hot PLC programmer, you're going to do well out there, right? Because, you know, ladder logic looks a lot like ladder diagrams, so you're good at both. Okay. All right, this is a good time for us to take a break and stretch our legs. Um, we're going to actually look at ladder logic next and learn how to program it. We're going to try some examples out after the break. So let's... Uh, time is it now it's it's 11 o'clock so let's say we'll take a break till 11 10 all right you guys good with that yeah sounds good Craig <laughs> okay all right I'll see you in that I'll see you in 10 minutes you guys
All right, you guys all back. Everybody yeah, we're back. <laughs> okay, you've been back. <laughs> A quick question, Craig, before you get started again. Okay. Uh, so uh, normally on quizzes, we can see what we got wrong. Yep. Uh, not on quiz five. Oh. Well, I'm not. Uh... Quiz five, pneumatic control. Yeah, and the only reason why I want to like actually know what I did wrong was because that's the worst quiz I think I've ever taken in this class. <laughs> and you were so good with pneumatics too. Okay, let me see. Well, that's why I was uh, kind of crapping when I hit send and I saw the result. I was like, wait a minute, I thought I understood this. <laughs> well, it could be, like you say, it could be some questions in the question problems too. So I'm just right. looking at it right now. The law of Temkin said it's graded, the law of export degrades. Okay, uh, submission views, default view. Yeah. Add additional view. Show questions. So show all questions with user response. Show question score. I think that's what I want to do. Show all questions with user response and show the question score out of. Um, safe. All right, might work now. Might Do you not. know if there's a way to go back and see it? Yeah, just you should be able to go back and look at the quizzes you've done and look at your okay. submission. If you click on submission, it should open up the quiz and it'll show you um, whatever happened. Okay, thank okay. you. Cool. All right, well, let's get going again. We got some more PLC magic to work with today. Um, share screen, share that screen. There we go. Okay, relay type instructions. So these are the instructions we use in the, the PLC programming language. And I've been foreshadowing a lot of these things. In the previous uh, set of slides we just looked at that part of the slide deck we were talking about the different languages that were available we talked about how plcs have a microprocessor and a bunch of memory and the memory is set up into these things called tables little blocks of blocks of memory called tables and they can be anything from inputs to outputs to status to counters to timers all set up in these tables right so you got to imagine everything inside the plc is circling around these tables. Uh, input is brought in from the cards stored on the table. The output table is copied and sent to the, the output cards. So uh, everything is memory. And you have to kind of get a grasp on that in order to understand how the instructions work in a PLC. So we're gonna look at the instructions. This is a ladder diagram and it uses symbols and the symbols you can see here uh, take two forms. It takes the form of contacts and coils. Coils are outputs. The coils kind of look like a circle. You can see right here. Oops, that down there. So there's a there's a coil. And these contacts take the form of contacts. They look like two vertical lines that are contacts. Some of them are normally closed contacts. Some of them are normally open contacts. At least that's what they look like. Okay, they're not really normally open, normally closed. One of them is looking for a one. One of them is looking for a zero right and they and, and they will either be true or false based on whether they're ones or zeros so you can see here if you uh if you have a symbol like this this is called this symbol here is a very special name it's called an xic xic stands for examine if closed it's saying it's asking the the immortal question 
is this switch closed? <clears throat> and if it's closed, of course, it expects to see a one, right? If the switch is closed, like you see here with the big finger, uh, it's, it's going to be a one. So if the memory bit is closed, it will produce a one at that location. Okay. So that's examine if closed. So we're and here. one of those things, if it's closed, it produces a one. If there's 12 volts, if there's voltage on that pin, right? And examine if closed will be true if it's a one, right? It's looking to so, see if it's, if it's a one on that input. So a one on an input is a true condition or an on condition, right? So a normally open switch hooked up to an input, if you press it, it will produce a, a volt, a true, a one, a voltage, right? So a one corresponds to a true or an on condition. Now this is, this is where the mindset in, in most people who are getting used to PLCs gets a little skewed. Because up till now, you've been looking at ladder diagrams as something that conducts, right? If a push button is closed, it conducts. And if you have conduction all the way across your, your rung to a coil, the coil comes on. So you're looking for conduction. In PLCs, you're not looking for conduction, you're looking for truth. Is something true or something false? And if you have a series of truths, all a line of truths leading up to your coil, then you're gonna get the thing turned on. So the instruction is true or one, if it, it, it will allow a rung continuity through itself, just like a closed relay contact, but not really, right? You're looking for a path of truth, kind of like Zen, you know, when you're, when you're trying to put yourself in a state of enlightenment, you're looking for the path of truth, right? Well, that's what PLCs are like. You've, you've seen PLC programmers, they're all like gurus, right? Sitting cross-legged on a mountain someplace, looking for the path to truth. All right, now a zero, that's bad. Zero is false. Zero means it's a off. It's zero. Here's a here's an input uh, card number one, bit number four that is not turned on. It is false. It is zero, right? So, an examine if closed XIC instruction would would ring false for this input, okay? Why? Because there's no voltage error. It's not true. It's not closed. I examined if it's closed. And it ain't, so it's false. Okay. Craig, if there, if the push button was closed, but yep. there was still no voltage, would it still read a zero? Yep. Would it read? If if there was if there was a break in the system here and there was no voltage going into it, it right. would they would think, oh, it's it's um it's open. I can't see it, right? And so if like a problem like that happened where it yeah. broke, you'd be able to go in and you'd look at on your computer and you would be able to That's see. That's right. I would, stick, I, I, would stick, to, I would stick a voltmeter on this pin to see if there actually is a voltage when I push yeah. the button. So if I push the button and I use the voltmeter on the pin and it, it shows no voltage, oh, okay, incredible. something's wrong with the hardware, not the software. Okay. Right. And I can usually use a voltmeter. You can also use a trouble light, just a little lamp tied to ground. Okay. And the hardware is the buttons and all yep. the that's all the hardware. That's the field device, right? That's what we call the field device. Because it's out the in the things field. you would actually press, the buttons you would actuate. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And that'll produce a voltage on these pins or not. And an XIC, if there's a voltage, will say true. Yes. Thumbs up, right? And if it, if it doesn't show voltage, it's going to show false. Thumbs down, zero. Can you use relays and PLCs in yep. conjunction? Yep. Oh. For an input, you can use relay contacts if you want, sure. Okay. As long, as, as, long as you get a voltage, that input. Okay. Okay. Now, um, so here we see uh, a very simple instruction. Examine if closed. And this is uh, input card one, bit number four. So input card one, bit number four, which is what well, looks like it would be right there. That's input card one, bit number four, and it's false. It's zero. There was no voltage going into that, 
so this thing is going to show false. You can tell when it's true because it gets all lit up. Like sometimes there's a box around it, sometimes there's green lines around it or yellow. So when it's true and it's excited, it kind of lights up. And when it's false, it, it's just as you see it on screen. All right, so, so that's an examine if closed. This symbol, this is the other one. This is called an examine if open, X-I-O. And there's a symbol and it looks like a normally closed contact, but it ain't. It's not a normally closed contact. It's looking at the pin to see if it's zero. If it's zero, it rings true. If it's one, it says false. So this one is looking for an open, looking for a zero. Okay, so that's when we use this symbol. If we want, if we want the input to be zero, if we want that to be the truth, then we use an XIO, an XIO instruction. Okay, could we yep. look back at the examine if closed one? I want to compare. Sure. So there's an examine if closed. Okay. All right. So Oops, sorry, sorry, that's not a. Uh, examine if open. Going the wrong way. There's an examine if closed. Oh yeah, there it is. Oh, right. twenty or this one, yeah. Yeah, examine if closed. So you notice here, it's not closed. There's no voltage, zero volts going into this thing. So it says, oh, it's zero. Okay, but and these are if the guy the pressed the button like software. this one. Yeah, the oh, guy pressed okay. the button like this one. There's going to be a one. So the examine if Close is going to look how it's green. Look at that green on there. See that green? Yeah. It's happy. It's a happy instruction. See? Okay. That instruction, happy instruction. That makes sense. Right. So that's examine if closed. You're looking for a one. This is examine if open. You're looking for a, what are you looking for with examine if open? Zero. zero. Right. You're looking for a zero. So, and if it's a zero it there, zero, it reads a one. That's right. So here, Look at this one. Here's an examine if open, and the guy pressed the button on input four, which is put, put a one in there. So this examine if open is going to be off. He is a very sad instruction, right? Because he doesn't see his zero. He's ex looking for an open. He's seeing a closed. He's seeing a one, right? So he's sad. However, if, if Charlie takes his finger off the push button, oops. If Charlie takes his finger off the push button right here, now it's open. There's zero volts here. There's a logical zero showing up on its memory location. This thing is all lit up, right? So now it's a very happy instruction, okay? Because you can see the little green lines right there. It's true. Yay, it is zero. So examine if uh, open is looking for a zero for an off condition. This is, this is the only the most mind bending part of switching over to ladder logic from a ladder diagram is ladder logic looking for zeros and ones. Ladder diagrams are looking for continuity, conduction through the path, right? All right. Oh, I see. Oh, a light just went on. <laughs> well, we'll see when you get to the lab. Yeah. Uh. Anyway, that's literally what I always say. I'm like, oh, I understand it. Just kidding. Yeah, that's right. I don't understand well, you know, this level of understanding and people people understand and then they forget and they understand and forget and understand, you know, and a lot of times you have to go through because your brain is more than one path to, to uh, learn something and you have to go through a few paths until it kind of sits. And that's why I say it's beautiful because you got these labs, long, long labs to, to try these things out. Where in engineering, the labs, maybe you get one hour a week and then a lot of theory, right? So there's less paths to understand. It. Okay, so this is examine if, uh, if open. And there's the examine if open instruction, right? So look right here, see, this is bit four, which is uh, right there. And it's open, it's open right now. So this right now is happy. You can see it lit up, that yellow part indicates it's true. It's true, it is zero. I'm a happy guy. So he's gonna turn on his output. There's a path of truth from left to right to the output. So the output is gonna turn on, right? So whatever is hooked up to output zero is gonna be turned on. We all like to be turned on. 
Okay, so here's the third instruction of the three instructions you gotta worry about. Output energized, that's the coil, right? That's the contact, uh, the, the coil symbol, the circle symbol. So when it's energized, when there's a one sent to this circle, when there's a one in its memory location, it's turned on. When there's a zero in its memory location, it's turned off. Okay, so uh, instruction is associated with the memory bit that energizes with a one and de-energizes with a zero. It's all there is to it. So output energize, OTE, OTE, right? Sounds like something that Java, Java would say. Um, is, uh, yeah, just really simple. So here we see an OTE instruction. See the output uh, OTE instruction here is set to card number two, bit number one on that card. So there's card number two and bit number one, zero one, you can see right there. And it's set to a high. Why is it high? Well, because it's got two contexts, two uh, XIO, XIC contexts, and this one's true and that one's true. So we have a path of truth. So this is gonna be true, All right? Well, it's true, so it sets its bit to a one so the card will see that bit being set to a one and put a voltage to its output, right? What voltage depends on the card and how you wired it up. Could be five volts, could be 12 volts, could be 24 volts, could be 120 volts. Doesn't matter, it's whatever the card is set to produce. So in this case, it's going to a pilot lamp, which is gonna light up. Okay, so, Looking back a little deeper, we can see these two inputs here, these two inputs, pin one and pin four, are hooked up to limit switches, and both limit switches were on. So you got a one on both of those, and those ones uh, changed that, change that rung, made, made both inputs true, made the output true, output lights up, right? So that's the OTE instruction. And there's an OTE uh, simulation. You can actually see this input and that input are true, they're high. So the, the uh, XICs, examine if closed, are both happy. They're all lit up yellow, which is great, both of them, which means the output is happy because it has a path of truth, right? So the output, so the output will be high. And here's the output table, and there's the output bit that are high. And whatever sucked out that output bit, which is over here on the output card, whatever is hooked up to it, it's going to light up. All right. So this this car. Any questions on OTE before I go on? OTE. Okay. So the action of a field device and a PLC bit. So this is just talking about how the field devices, like the, con the push buttons and the limit switches and stuff, affect the PLC device. So here we have a uh, contact A, right? If, if the A is open, a XIC will be false and an XIO will be true. So we can see two rungs here, with two outputs, uh, A and A bar, a bar, so A will be a false, and A bar will be a true if it's open. Examine if open will be true if it's open. However, with the same two instructions on the right side here, if A is closed and we have a binary one, then XIC will be true, XIC will be true, and XIO will be false. So again, we're just hammering away at that same point, it's zero, if it's looking for an X, if you want a zero, if you're looking for a zero, use an XIO. If you're looking for a one, use an XIC. All right. And here we can see the same thing. Uh, we got two rungs and we can see that uh, uh, it's hooked up to bit zero, which is right here, hooked up to bit zero. And if it's open, like it is right now, then output zero is going to be off because it's using an XIC, and output one is going to be on because it's using an XIO. Examine if open, right? 
So that's what make that's what ladder diagrams do. Uh, ladder diagrams control outputs based on a combination of inputs and what those inputs are doing, the, co the conditions of the inputs. That's what we're saying in the first part here. Each contact or coil symbol is referenced with an address, so you can see an address on each one of these things that show you what they're connected to. Input one, input two, input three, output one, and uh, and here's the output card, output one, right? Now you can use the same context over and over and over again. So you can see here, um, we have input two right here on this rung, and we have input two down there too, right? You can use input two a hundred times. Talk about your infinite number of contacts on a relay. You can have as many as you want. Input one can show up, input two can show up any, any ladder rung you want, doesn't matter. And there's input three, uh, input three's only shows up on the one. And here's another cool thing. You can also use an output as an input, right? So here, you know how you seal circuits by taking one of the contacts of an output relay and using it to short out an input, right? Well, here's the sealing circuit. Output one is being used as an instruction called, uh, well, this was an XIC instruction. So it's output one. So when output one is true, then this one becomes true, right? And it seals around input one. So you can use an output, OTE, as an input contact, right? And that, that's very powerful. That gives you a lot, of, a lot of potential. A lot of potential for program control. So is that like sealing a circuit? That's exactly okay. what that is. Uh, that, so sealing totally circuits cool. now have less pain involved. That's right. So you don't have to worry about ceiling contacts or anything like that. You just you just take the output and use it anywhere you like as a as an input. Right? All right. Very, very cool. So here's here's how the PLC analyzes a, a, a program. This is how it reads its programs. It starts at rung zero, like I mentioned, and goes from left to right and then goes from left to right, and then goes the next rung, left to right, and then the next rung, left to right. So it starts at the top and then works its way down, okay? Now, each element of it can be false or true, right? If, if in rung zero, you can see a false showed up right away, right, before the other ones showed up, the PLC will not even bother checking the other ones. It doesn't have to, it's already failed this rung. Because if that's false and there's two truths, it doesn't matter. It's not a path of truth. So this is gonna be false and it will instantly go to the next rung, right? So it'll just, it'll, it'll check the first bit. Oh, it's false. The heck with the rest of the rung, I don't care about it. That rung is false and it goes to the next one. It sees this one's true. So it gonna, it's gonna make that output true. Then it goes to rung two and it sees this one's false, but it says, oh, oh but there's a parallel path. And that one's true. That parallel path is true. So there's truth there. This one's true. And then that one's true. And then that one's true. So I'm gonna turn on lamp here. I'm gonna make this output true. And you can, e you can even have outputs in parallel. So here we can see two things have happened. This might be a motor, that might be a lamp, right? So we got two things in parallel, two different outputs become true. So when the logic continuity exists at least one path, the condition and output energize are said to be true. But you gotta have logic continuity. You gotta have a path of truth through all of those, uh, all of those runs. And there's a path for this one, and there's a path for that one, and this guy, he don't have a path. So his, his output is not gonna come on. And there we can see the same thing in the programming language. If we're, if we're examining a, a running system, you can see here, uh, we have this one's true and that one's true, but that one's false. So the output's false. This one's true and he's the only one in the rung. So, so that one's true, oops. That one's true, so the output's true, right? In rung two, and, sorry, rung one, and rung two, 
well, here's, this one's true, and that one's true, and that one's true, so both of these guys on the output are going to be true. And this is the end rung. It's always the last rung that shows up in a program. You've always got to have an end rung. It's like an end rung. All right. Okay. Cool. So any questions <laughs> about that? Any questions about logic continuity and the fact that you've got to have a path of truth to your output? Okay. Uh, so, so pretty much it's just like all the other ladder diagrams that we've had, right? Except, except instead of continuity, it's truth you're looking for. Right. right. You're not looking for a conductive path. And um, where I, I see a lot of guys in... Um, when they first start this thing is they'll actually wire up push buttons like this and there's a limit switch and they wire it all up and then take that and put that into the screw terminal of a PLC. So they're, they're doing their logic in the wiring, right? And then drive that into an input of a PLC. No, 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 no. This logic is what the PLC is doing. You just take your inputs you take the individual switches and tie them to individual inputs of your PLC. So every, every your, your push button and your limit switch and everything go all by themselves from power into the PLC. One lousy connection, right? And then you take care of the logic inside the PLC. That's the big difference. I, when, I was, when I taught this years and years ago, I used to laugh at people that did this to the inputs. And now I just kind of cry. Because it's it happens every time. Okay. Okay. Well, this little section here is we're going to talk about instruction addressing. Just a real real quick little three slide thing. Uh, instruction addressing. So every every bit every instruction has an address. So if you look at this uh, rung right here at the bottom. You can see this is this particular instruction is input card number three. All right, there's card number three, and it's bit number 12 on that card, right? So that's the address for that bit, and that defines exactly which of these pins is going to be hooked up to the uh, to the program to that particular instruction. And here, output card four. So it's the fourth card, zero, one, two, three, fourth card, bit zero, All right? So let, right here, uh, the fourth card would be, let's say it's zero, one, two, three, four. So the fourth card is probably this guy right here, All right? And that's an output card probably, I guess. And uh, zero. Yeah, what else can we, what else does it say here? Uh, and there you can see the simulated operation of an instruction addressing. So here's all, these things all represent inputs and these all represent outputs. And this is the, this is the instruction, right? So you can, you can put your instructions down. Those little question marks have to be answered. Which input pins and which output pins are gonna be connected, right? So you have to assign an address for every input and every output. So uh, let's try that. Let's just, uh, let me just go through a, a PLC program real quick and we'll show you how, how, how a person would do something like that. Logic Pro. Okay, so here's Logic Pro. And I'm just gonna add a new rung. So here's a blank rung that shows up right here. And up here, you can see at the top, I wish I can go to a lower resolution, but I can't. Should have uh, done that before I went into uh, Zoom. But this is an output energize instruction. So I'm gonna click on that. And you can see an output energize shows up right here with the question mark. Uh, I know what I can do. Um, I'm gonna bring up the magnifier. There we go. That might work. <laughs> that, is not, that is totally not working. 
Okay, I will not bring up the magnifier. I'm going to click on this and close that magnifier. Sorry about that. Magnifier was not a good idea. Okay, and I'm going to I'm going to hook up two. I'm going to put two. There's my XIO instruction right here, and there's my other XIO instruction. They always go on the other sides. The coils are the last thing to go. I'm just going to drag them over to there. So I have two instructions and an output, and I have let run z letter zero. I'm going to cut that run. So I have now I just have this one run with two two XICs and an output. Now these are my inputs over here on the left side, input one through whatever. So I'm gonna take input, input card one bit zero, and I'm gonna take it and physically, I'm gonna click on it and I'm gonna drag it over to this question mark. And now you see it says input one slash zero, right? That represents this switch. I'm gonna take the second input, input one slash one, and I'm gonna drag it over to this contact. That's input colon one slash one and i could type it too i can just go i colon one slash one it's the same thing right and i'm gonna i can also take these things and i can put a symbol i can edit that symbol and i can give it a name uh i can call it temperature okay and i'm gonna put this one and i'm gonna give it a name i'm gonna call it pressure Okay, and I'm going to turn off the wizard. Now the outputs, output over here is going to be one of these lamps. I have two output cards. I got output card four. I got output card two. So I'm going to take output card two and lamp number one. I'm going to drag it over. Where are we here? Come on. Let's do it the hard way. O uh, output colon two slash one. Okay, and now I have now hook this thing up to lamp two. And I'm going to call that, I'm going to edit the symbol. I'm going to call it my lamp. Okay, so now my program's written. Uh, I, I've assigned the addresses to the contacts. I can run the thing. So let's try that. So if I go here and we'll go online, first of all, then we'll download this code to the PLC and we'll go into run mode. And now if I, if I operate zero, notice this one's true, but that one, but what's your one, one dash one is false. So the output is false. And if I operate the second switch, both of these are true. So those are both true. So my lamp is true. And if you look at the output down here, you can see that lamp is turned on. Right? So I have to have both inputs on in order for the lamp to be turned on. Right? So as, as I just demonstrated, you drag your instructions over, you place them down, and, uh, and then you just run the program like that. But you, have, you have to make sure you address the, each individual instruction. Okay. Now, how do you do a branch instruction? Branches instructions are used for OR operations, right? So we want to put things in parallel for an OR operation. So you just, you just add on a parallel branch like this. You can see the branches got a little, little rung on it. And I can, I can do the same thing over here too. I can, I can um, go back offline. I'll go offline. You always program offline. I'm going to take this instruction here and I'm going to add it in. So there's my little branch. I'm going to put the pressure on the one side and I'm going to put the temperature on the other side. There it is. So I can do parallel, right? And now either one can be on and my output will be on. So uh, branch instructions, branch instructions are used to create parallel paths. And you can see here, there they are. Um, and, uh, and there you can see another prat. This this particular one would be uh, D equals A and not B or C. A and not B or C. 
Okay, so parallel branches, easy to do, look like that. Uh, I, can, I can output to multiple outputs, as you can see here, so I can branch my outputs. So C, D, and E, you can see are just, they'll all come on. When that rung is true, they'll all come on. And over here, we, got, we, can, we can have C, E, and E is kind of cool because E needs A or B, but it has to have D as well. So you can actually branch and, and have a, a instruction before your coil. So in this one, you can see E is going to equal uh, A or B and D. That's going to be E, where C is just going to equal A or B. So that's kind of a funky thing you can do with the uh, programming instructions as well. Okay, and there we go. Um, uh, this, this one shows that you can actually nest instructions if you want to, a nested, a nested branch. So you can see we have instructions nested inside other instructions like that. Okay, that can be, that can be done. Uh, some PLC programs don't allow this kind of stuff to happen. So I, I think what they're saying here is that, uh, PLC programs are a function of the manufacturer. Uh, Alan Bradley's got some rules they, they have about their programming style. Control, uh, Telemechanique has other rules. Um, Siemens has other rules. So in some PLCs, you can get away with tricks that you can't get away with, with other manufacturers. So you kind of have to get used to the language you're working on. But uh, I guess what we're trying to get at here is there are, there are sometimes rules and conditions in some PLC languages. Uh, that you have to be aware of when you're using them. Now, when you're putting uh, rungs in parallel or series, sometimes there's limits. For instance, in some PLCs, you can only have 10 contacts on a line, right? maximum 10 contacts. Some you can have more, some you can have less, but most PLCs, you know, this, this particular PLC can have tens, and then you can have a maximum of in this case, seven parallel lines, right? So you can have an uh, instruction here and then seven instructions, or I can, I'll put four of them down here. I can have four instructions in parallel, that's okay. I could have five, I could have six, but I can't have eight, which is not allowed. So again, it's a function of what your PLC is. You may not be able to put an infinite number of parallel instructions or an infinite number of series instructions. Depends on your PLC. Okay, uh, you can't do this. Okay, you can't put vertical instructions. It doesn't work. So if you're thinking you can, like, this means that is true, ACE is true. Uh, if you wanna do ACE is true, do it as a parallel rung, right? You can't do it, you can't do it like that by using a vertical run, a vertical connection like that. You have to be horizontal. So uh, if your intent was to go ACE, ACD like this, ACD to make it true, just put it as a, another run, right? They're free, contacts are free. You can use as many as you need. So this slide is just saying you can't expect to be able to use vertical contacts like that guy. Other rules, uh, you can't go backwards, right? So you can see here, this guy was hoping that this would be a path to truth, you know? Uh, F and D and B and C, right? I can, I can go that direction. Well, no, you can't. If you want to go F and D and B and C, use another rung, right? Okay, more rules. Okay, so the next set of slides we're going to look at is uh, 
the internal relay instructions. And we're gonna, we're gonna have a look at those after a break. So it's 11, 11.51 right now. So let's take a break until noon. We'll take a break until noon, and then we'll come back and, and do a little bit more, a little bit more program. Okay. So I'll see you in ten minutes. See you in ten. <laughs>
Either I don't understand this one question that I missed, or I think it's wrong. <laughs> what question is that, Ethan? There's a question on the quiz five that talks about making adjustments to an electrical and pneumatic schematic style thing. Okay. And it asks which one's right, which suggestion's right. Let me see if I can dig that out. So assessments. One of the suggestions changes nothing. Yeah, I don't want to say it out loud because I don't know who's taking it or not. Okay, we're talking quiz number five. Yeah. Pneumatic control. Okay. Let's see if I can dig yours out. Oh, I wouldn't look at that grade. Uh, I won't broadcast it. <laughs> I think I figured out everything out else out. There were some confusing questions on it. I didn't understand some of the wording for it. And now that I go back through it, it makes sense somewhat. <laughs> but this one I can't figure out. I have no idea why it's like that. Okay, let's have a look. So which question was it? It says Bob and Doug have designed and built an electro-pneumatic circuit. Okay, right. Good old Bob and Doug. Yeah, they've designed so, a pneumatic circuit. So let me um, can I just share the screen? I won't share the whole test. Yeah, sure. All right. Share screen. This one. Bob and yeah. Doug designed and built an electro-pneumatic circuit shown below. One of the requirements is that pressing just the PB2 button makes cylinder 1A1 extend towards and stop at 1S1. So it's a double rod. Goes left and goes right. Uh, by pressing just PB3, the cylinder 1A1 should extend towards and stop at 1S2. So PB1 makes it go left, PB2 makes it go right. Right? So obviously, um, we have a limit switch 1S1, 1S2 limit switch, and we have the solenoid right here. So the solenoid, when it's uh, on the left side, it looks like it's going that direction. So uh, Bob suggests that they need to change PB3 to normally open and PB2 to normally close to make the systems work correctly. Uh, Which really, that does nothing. No, really. Doug suggests that they need to adjust the pneumatic port 2, 1v1, uh, port 1s2, and connect port 4, 1v1, to port 1 of 1s1 to make the system work correctly. Right. So I took that as like, okay, he says port 2 of 1v1. Well, there is no 1v1 technically. So I just took it as he's talking about 1v2. Yeah, good point. Yep, there's only one. You know what I mean? that's, that's what I was thinking. And then as of right now, if you push PB2, CR1 activates, the right side activates, which kicks it over yep. and fills air up on the left side, sending it to LS2, which right. is wrong. So when PB2 is operated, control relay one is operated, which means that uh, this one will be, uh, okay. This one will be on and that one will be off, which means it will operate the right side right? Which means it will operate this direction. Oops, sorry. Backwards. It's operating the right side, which means it will operate in this direction, which pushes ports 
one to four, which will push it to the right. 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 So pressing PV2 will make it go to the right. Right, which is not what it's asking for. Yeah. Pressing PV2 makes a, a cylinder 1A1 extend downwards. Well, again, why is, this thing, why is this thing downwards? Or no, it says extend, extend towards. towards and stop at 1S1, which is to the left. Right. right. So Doug suggests that they need uh, just just adjust the pneumatics. Port two of one v one, that should be one v two, to port one of one s two. Yeah. So what they're, what they're saying is just swap these. It's only backwards. All right. So the cylinder is just behaving backwards, uh, which is true. You could you could certainly swap that and then it would work correctly, but Doug suggests they need to, or Bob suggests they should change PB3 to normally open and PB2 to normally close. Yeah, that would do nothing. Yeah. Right. If you make that normally open and normally close, you just messed up your electronics and it's not going to work. It's not going to be a start stop circuit. So Bob is really wrong. Bob, Bob, Bob's poor Bob is bad. Bob is bad, but Doug is right. Yeah, you could just switch those two around. And I see your point about the 1v1. I guess whoever wrote this question. But that's that's not the answer. Yeah, but quick, the correct so answer was is right only, only Doug is correct in this one. Okay. Doug yeah, is correct. That, you can cross those two. That, just to give you a heads up on the test, that marks you wrong if you put that down. Only Doug's suggestion is correct? Yeah. See how it says Bob and Doug are both wrong for the answer oh, on yes. yours? Yeah, Bob and Doug is both wrong. So why is... Uh, why is Doug I'm, I'm guessing the only thing that I could guess at this They're point is that wrong there's no 1v1. There's no 1v1. So assuming there's that it's 1v2. Oh my gosh. So you, you think you think that was the that little word error? That's right the there only was, thing. That's why I was like, do I assume that they're talking about 1v2 or are they that's, that's pretty mean. Thing? That's pretty mean, isn't it? Yeah. You're analyzing uh, the whole circuit and it's just like a mislabeling. And it sounds like a typo. Yeah, I didn't write this one. <laughs> That's mean. Well, for everybody did, else out there, there you go. If you did swap it, if you did swap those two, um, that would fix it. Well, yeah, it wouldn't totally fix it. Yeah. See what he's he's talking about. If you swap, if you swap these lines, right? Mm -hmm. Right. At that point, well. The problem with doing that is this thing is still a roller lever on 1S2, but you want that to be a roller lever on 1S1 if you swap it. See, the roller levers are still will be connected on the wrong side. Even though the cylinder will move correctly, the roller, roller levers are going to be reversed. So that's another reason that really just swapping it there wouldn't have been a good idea. Yeah, it it's works. not a good idea, but it works no. technically. It sort of works, except for the roller levers are wrong, right? Yeah. No, probably, I get what you're saying. Probably, I was just yeah, probably would have been better if I was to suggest that <clears throat> I get a correction for this. I think if you swapped them right here, right after the roller levers. Yeah, swap them there or swap swap out a normally closed and normally open contact relay. Or yeah, you could you could it's kind of roller levers here could have been swapped out. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'll have to see. I wonder who wrote this one. I'll have to find out what their intent was. Someone there. who obviously doesn't like their students. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I would just like you said, Ethan, as soon as it as soon as you see the one v one, you could argue they're both wrong. There is no one v one. Right. And then yeah. you can say, well, like, the guy who wrote the question was wrong. So I love that. Let the me, problem uh, is, is like with like three out of six of our courses, if you don't assume that they're talking about 1v2, you'll get it wrong, even though it's a typo. Yeah. I'm going to take this. I'm going to cut that. And I'll just send that to... Uh, I know who probably wrote that one and say, what are you doing to our students? You don't piss Ethan off. Okay. <laughs> All right. 
All right, got some more. See, the one thing about these online instructions uh, teaching is it's, it's very difficult to give you guys kind of work practice when there's 32 of you. So at this point, like all the way through here, we would have been programming the virtual PLC and trying experiments out and stuff like that. Kind of hard to do when there's 30, no, 32 of you guys. And you're all, I don't know what kind of computer you're on. If you're on a computer at all, you could be on a Mac, which doesn't run it. You could be on a tablet, which doesn't run it. Yeah, a couple I'm of you guys are Mac. probably on a phone. So we just have to keep pushing on through, I guess. One hour to go. Okay. Internal relay instructions is the next section here. So an internal, you, you can actually um, write to, well, when you're, when you're writing to an output, like you're writing to an output here and here, you're actually writing to a real card. But you don't have to write to an output itself. You can write to a memory bit inside the PLC that doesn't control an output. So that's what they're talking about here, is that there is a whole table set up called a binary table. It's one of those tables we looked at before. And the binary table has no connection to inputs or outputs. It is simply a scratch pad, right? So you can take a binary uh, bit in the binary table and set it high or set it low or do anything you want with it and, and, and use it later on in your program. It can be just a, just a scratch pad, right? Sort of memory. So the advantages of using these internal outputs is there are many situations where no output instruction is required. There's no physical connection required. You just need to store something. For instance, uh, I could take this bit three right here, this bit right here, and I could set it as a flag, a flag that means slow, right? And then later on in the program, I could say, turn the motor on, and, but I want to know, should I turn it on slow or fast, right? Well, I can look at that bit, and that bit, if it was set to one, that means uh, I want it turned on slow. So you set that bit early on in the program, right here, you can read it back and say, oh, I want the motor to be turned on slow, and then you can do the operation to turn it on slow. So, so it could be used, you know, kind of as a status bit or a, a flag, we call them sometimes, or a or an answer to a question that's gonna be used later on in the program. So that's, that's what the uh, binary table is. It's just a, a scratch pad, a little bit of memory you can use to hold information. So uh, in the, the slick 500s, they use a binary table B3, that's what they call it, B3. And here we can see an example of somebody using a binary table. Um, there's a whole bunch of whole bunch of rungs in, in run number one, whole bunch of instructions that set binary table three, bit three, right? Set it or, or not set it. And then later on, later on in the program, in this case, not very much later on, it's rung two, um, they're using that output as a condition for this uh, discrete output. So this, this is the one that's connected up to a, maybe a lamp, or a motor or a relay or something like that. This one, the top one, was just a memory element. And that memory element was used in the instruction for that discrete output. So I don't know if this kind of makes sense, but it's, it's just a way of storing information to be used later on in the program. That's called a, uh, that's called a, a binary, binary table element. And there you can see an example uh, using, uh, using Logix Pro, where we have a binary table being, uh, a binary bit being uh, controlled by all these uh, inputs, zero through six. And then that binary bit is used right there to continue it on. Now, this binary element is kind of handy if you have a limit to the number of bits you're allowed to use in a run. I mentioned before some PLCs you can only put in seven instructions. Maybe you're only allowed to put seven in, but I actually want to use 15, but I can't, you know, but I can only put seven in a rung. Well, what this guy did was he, he used the seven of them to control a binary element, and he put that binary element in the next rung with the remaining bits he wanted. One, two, three, four, five, five more. 
right? What's that, Levi? Nothing. Um, there was just some noise going on outside my room, so I was just turning the volume up and making sure that my recording microphone here could actually hear it and not pick okay. up the chaos. <laughs> right. Gotcha. So you see here, they've taken that binary element and use it to expand the number of contacts. That's one, one way you could use these little binary bits, right? But basically they're storage, right? You can use them for storing bits. Here we go. Contact expansion, what they're doing there. All right. So now, how do you program an examine if closed and examine if open instructions? This is what this next set of slides all about. So when you, when you program an uh, examine if closed instruction, you can see here, this is, this is how you hardwire a circuit, as you saw, we saw with a normally open and normally closed connection, PV1 and PV2. Um, but if you want the pilot light to come on when both of these are there, just because this is a normally open switch and this is a normally closed switch, that doesn't necessarily mean you want to have a normally closed contact here. It's the intent of what you're trying to do that you're, you're looking at in this particular case. Oh, hold on for a sec. It's the intent of what you're trying to do. So the normal state of the field device does not matter. What matters is that the contacts need to be closed. So in this particular instruction, the intent here on the hardwired instruction was when PV1 is closed and PV2 is closed, the output should be high, right? And that's why you're choosing uh, normally, uh, the normally examine if closed operation right here, okay? That's, that was the intent of the circuit. So there we can see the same thing right there. PB1 and PB2 are just still set up as examine if closed instructions, right? So when PB1 is pressed and PB2 is not pressed, then the output will go high. Here's another example. Uh, let's say we had a hardwire instruction where PB1 operates, PB1 here, when it's pressed, operates a control relay. And that control relay's normally closed contact turns on a pilot light, right? So that means if you don't operate PB1, if you don't operate PB1, the pilot light will be on. If you do operate PB1, the pilot light will be off. That's the same as saying pilot light equals not PB1, right? If you don't press PB1, the pilot light will be on. So um, you'd have to do it sort of like this if you wired it up, but in the PLC, you just have to put, you just have to put not PB1 equals pilot light. Okay, not PB1 equals pilot light, just like that. And, and, and that's exactly how it would show up in your actual program itself. So you can see here, uh, the, the logic state zero one indicates whether the instruction is true or false and the basis of controller operation. So, um, well, we already discussed that this particular operation here. So let's talk about how you actually put things into a ladder diagram. Don't worry about those two steps. So in order to write a program on a PLC, we have to use some kind of an IDE, an environment, uh, 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 develop an interface. And the environment uh, they want to use for uh, Alan Bradley, for pro programming PLCs like, like this Alan Bradley system right here, has been called, in the old days, used to be called RS Logics. And now it's been through a lot of incarnations. Now they call it MicroLogics and control logics, right? But always logics with an X on the end of it. So that's the name of the package, the software that we use for programming PLCs. Now, in your lab, in, uh, in TT220, it's using a micro logics, the micro logics environment. And if you're losing a, 
more sophisticated system, then you'd use something called control logics, just a bigger, more powerful system. It's control logics and then micro logics. Now, usually, control logics and micro logics are run on a, PL, a PC computer, just like your, your PC in front of you. I don't see variants of it yet that work on Macintoshes or tablets or phones or anything. Mostly it's PCs that are used as the uh, programming language for these things. So this is an example of RS logics for the SLC 500. So you can see it's got, uh, it's got basically a menu bar up here. It's got uh, a, a tree, a control tree on the side that has all, this, all the tables and things, all the memory elements and stuff and status indicators on that. And then you have a programming window. And the programming window itself has got your actual code. Okay, so this is how the main window looks in a PLC program. Up at the top, up at the top of the program, right up in this area, right here, these are your instructions. Now the basic instructions show up under a tab called user, but there's also more advanced instructions like bit control and timers and counters and inputs and outputs. Those are tabs you can access for more advanced instructions. But in our case, um, most of the basic instructions are just in the user tab. So if you look in the user tab, uh, you'll see the basic instructions or the bit tab. The bit tab's got them too. Uh, you can see uh, the XIC instruction, the XIO instruction, uh, the uh, and the co coil instruction, the contact instruction, the OTE. Okay, you also have instructions called latch and unlatch. Now, latch and unlatch are kind of cool. What latch does is when you operate a latch, it stays latched. Even when the inputs go false, the output stays latched. It's latched on. And the only way to turn off a latched output is to use the unlatched. So this is the unlatch. Uh, output here. So like a momentary, sort of like a maintained contact push yep, button. Exactly like maintained. So you latch it with this one and it stays on and then you unlatch it, turns off and stays off. Right. That's what those two guys are. Okay. And to use any of these instructions in your program, all you have to do is click on the instruction and drag it down to your rung. Right. You just drag the instruction right onto the rung and, uh, and the way it goes. So here we can see my instructions up at the top. And if I want to, if I want to use an OT or X, X, A, O, I just drag it right down. Just drag them all on anywhere I want. There's a OTE. There's my latch, my latch coil. Put my latch coil there. Where is it here? I'm just dragging it to those little drops and there's the latch shows up right there. All the coils always go off to the right side. All right, drag and drop, super easy. Now, the processor, when you're about to, uh, when, when you're about to program to it, your software needs to know what kind of a card that you're actually using, what kind of, well, what kind of processor you have and what kind of card is on that processor. So you have to be, make sure before you download the code that you've written to your processor that you identify exactly what processor is being used. And Alan Bradley's got a bunch of them. There's a whole bunch of processors. And there's a whole bunch of optional cards you can add on to all the output cards and input cards and timers and counters and all that stuff. There's dozens of different kinds. And so you have to be very specific about what kind you use. So when you're about to download your code in the lab to the processor, you have to tell it what, what uh, actual card you're going to be using, what processor we actually need. Okay. Now in this case, they're choosing a, a 1747L40E in this example. But we're not going to be using that. We're going to be using the MicroLogix uh, processor, which we'll talk about in lab. All right. We also not, not only have to tell it what the processor is, we have to tell it what cards have been put on. So this particular MicroLogix processor, 1769 here, 
has got an optional card that has been added on. I can, I can pull that card off. Is it gonna let me? There we go. I can take this card off if I want to. I easily, come on, there we go. Popping it off. And then I can, I can stack a whole bunch of these cards onto this thing if I wanted to. But this card here has to be uh, enumerated in the software. So I would have to add on the cards that my processor uses. If I don't, I'm not gonna be able to access the features that that particular card has. Okay. So once we do include those things, uh, all the tables and stuff should be should be available to us. All right. And the relay instructions, as we know, show up as graphical information. And we know that when they're true, they show up with little green dots or sometimes little yellow bars over top. That means they're true. And if they're not true, they show up as just ordinary instructions with no, no bars, no green bars or yellow, uh, yellow highlights. Okay. okay, so once you've, uh, once you've identified the PLC that you're going to write to and you've identified all the cards that are in that PLC and you've set it all up so it's ready to go, now we have to put it into modes of operation. So there are three different kinds of modes of operation that the PLC can be in. One of them is program mode. And in program mode, of course, this means it's susceptible to be programmed. You can change it, you can adjust it, you can upload code, download code, all that stuff in program mode, okay? The next mode is remote mode. In remote mode, I can make it run or program from my PC, right? So I can, in, in the PC, I can put it into program mode or I can put it into run mode remotely, right? And the last mode of operation is the run mode. And in the run mode, the PLC is, is hard at work running your code. You can't change the code. You can't modify it. It's doing its job, okay? So the only time you can program it is when you're in program mode. The only time it actually executes the code full on, full speed, is in run mode, okay? And in remote mode, you can change it back and forth. But a lot of times PLCs, have a switch or something on board. So this uh, this PLC right here, you open it up. There we go. And little door on the side. You can see a little switch right here, right here. And that little switch goes between run mode, program mode, and remote mode. Okay. Now usually, Usually I keep this thing in remote mode so I can do all my adjustments. I can do all my adjustments from the, from the PC, from my computer environment, right? But if it's doing a job and I don't want anybody messing around with it and I don't want any chance of it being shut down by somebody remotely, I can put it in run mode and then this thing, even if you try to program it, it won't let you, right? So in run mode, it can't program it. And you can't interrupt it, it's doing its job. Okay, so program modes for entering programs, run modes for executing programs, and, uh, and then the remote position lets you control that stuff from another PC. Okay, so that's basically uh, all we need to do to, uh, to get the system running. So this is the slide deck uh, up till this point that I wanted to cover today. Talks all about the basics of the PLC and how to program it, what the instructions do and all that kind of stuff. Uh, how about if I was to try, I, I wanna demonstrate a, a simple program to you using Logix Pro, would that, would that help? Yeah, that definitely helped. Let's do that. Let's do something we're familiar with. You guys might remember a, a project you did a little while ago called a, a garage door opener, right? We had to open and close a garage door. Um, well, let's let's try that one out. So again, I'm going to see if I can change the resolution of this thing here. Display settings. My display settings don't let me change anything. No. 
because everything's so small on this. And I think it's because I'm, it's because I've got this thing dedicated to, uh, yeah, I better not quit. Okay, so let, let's try um, the garage door. So one thing about Logix Pro, it's so cool, it's got all these simulations. It's got the garage door simulator right there. It's got the, it's got a silo simulator for controlling a box that goes and gets filled up by crap from this silo on a conveyor belt. That's really cool. It's got a traffic simulator. So if you want to run, write a, a program to control traffic lights, you know, in any way you want them to be controlled, including crosswalks and stuff like that, you got that simulation. This is a batch simulator right here. It's used for controlling and mixing uh, um, Ethan Brow brew, right? So you got a stirring thing here and a couple pumps and an external pump and all that stuff. Um, what else we got? We got a binary coded decimal simulator. We've got a dual compressor. This is a, a, an air compressor, two-stage air compressor, controlling that. This is the bottle line stimulator that I know students, this will they'll pull your hair over this one. But this is one that fills up two sizes of bottles and, and uh, separates them and checks them for cracks and cleans them and stuff. And there's an elevator simulator. So all kinds of things. Now, this program, Logix Pro, I think it's, I think it costs 30 bucks or, or so to operate. And it's one of the most, if you, if you want to learn how to program, um, getting this and going through its simulations will take you a long ways because some of these simulations, very simple and basic operation, but extremely complicated in others, right? So you can, get, you can do the elevator simply or you can do it really elegantly, but, but that's complicated. So I, I like the uh, flexibility. But let's go back to the garage door simulator. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna just lose this rung, cut this rung. We're gonna start with a blank slate, and let's let's take our rungs one at a time. So let's look at the. Uh, we see we have a motor up and motor down, and we wrote we wrote a Boolean equation. Motor up is gonna equal the uh, open button or motor up and uh, not close and not close and uh, limit switch one. Limit switch one has to be operated. Do you remember that? Remember that equation? Motor up equals the open button or the motor is already going up and not the close button and limit switch one has to be pressed, which is up on the side. Remember that? Okay, so let me program that. I'm gonna uh, take a, a rung right now. So um, we'll drag this rung over here. And we, first of all, I'm just gonna do it sort of like how I expect it to be. So not closed, I'm gonna use the not instruction not closed instruction, uh, limit switch one. I'm gonna put that right there. And I'm gonna bring a parallel rung because I wanna have it open or motor up. Okay, so I'm gonna take this one here and I'm gonna edit the symbol. I'm gonna call this one open. And I'm gonna take this one, and I'm gonna edit the symbol and I'm gonna, oh, wait a second. It's not gonna let me do it until I actually set up the addresses because they're all addressed as question marks. So open, the open button, can you see down here where it says I colon one slash zero zero? That's the address for open. So let me put that in there. I colon one slash zero zero. Okay, and that's my open button. The close button, close button says I colon one slash zero one. If you look on the close down here, so let me put the address for the, for the close button. I colon uh, one slash one. And I'm gonna call that um, close, okay? And the limit switch is I colon one slash zero three, right? And I can type that in. I don't even have to type it. Actually, I can click on it here and drag it over and drop it on the question mark too, which is kind of fun, right? 
So I colon one slash zero three, and then I have to have an output. So I'll take my output, I'm gonna put it on the end of the rung. You can see it way over there on the right side. And that's my motor up, which is output two colon zero zero. And I'm gonna add that there. And I'm gonna rename, edit that symbol, I'm gonna rename it motor up. Okay, and I'm gonna to have to seal it, right? So I'm gonna seal it with this output to colon zero. So motor up is now also a contact. So you see motor up shows up here as motor up and motor up shows up here as a contact. So that, my friends, is the Boolean equation realized in ladder logic. Open and not closed, and, and uh, the limit switch, uh, oh, I, this one isn't really set up well. I should re-edit that one, call it uh, limit switch one. I'm just labeling it for my own convenience. My labels mean nothing to the code. It's just my own convenience. What means everything is I colon one slash three. Let's try it. Let's, let's just try this first instruction to see if I can open my door. So I'm gonna go online. Right, that means I'm connecting to my PLC. So I connect to the PLC using the serial cable. So here's a here's my serial cable right here <laughs> that, that plugs into this spot on the PLC. So I'm going to go online. I'm going to download. I click on the download button. My code is now downloaded, and now I can go in from from run from program mode to run mode. Okay, so now. If you look at my instructions here, it says limit switch one is operated. Well, it's operated because I can see it right there. The close button is operated because I haven't pressed closed and that's a normal, and I'm checking to see examine if closed. So I, it, or examine if open, examine if open. So it shows up as true. My open button shows up as false because I haven't pressed open. So let me press open, okay. There it goes. So I pressed open. When I pressed it, it started to go up. And, and it seals around motor up. See, the motor up is now working. The garage door is opening and it's sealing around that. It's kind of a creaky door. And if I press close button, that kills it. All right? I'm going to let it finish opening right here. You can see a motor's turning up there and it's opening. And when it gets to the top, if it ever gets to the top, that limit switch should stop it. Okay, the limit switch popped open. This limit switch over here, I input three, failed, right? It's no longer, it's chicken examine if closed and it's not closed, it's open. So it's killed it. So there is no path to motor up. So motor up is stopped. Does that make sense? Was that easier than wiring up all those things and all those relays? It was, but that could also be because I wasn't the one doing it. All right, so let's take, I'm gonna take this rung again. Let's go back into program mode. And I'm gonna copy this rung. And I'm gonna paste it below. Because I'm doing this because motor, motor down is pretty much the same as motor up. It looks exactly the same, except I have to change things around. For instance, this now becomes input one slash one, the close button. This one becomes input one slash zero, the open button, and limit switch two becomes uh, limit switch, the limit switch one becomes limit switch two, which is input four, input four, and I'm gonna relabel that one limit switch two. And my motor now becomes motor down. So it's output, looking on the side here, output two slash one, address one is motor down. And it's not called my lap, it's called- It goes off, I think I'm getting an Outlook email. It does, doesn't it? Yeah, no, it's just a very noisy program. So now closed and not open and limit switch two we had to change the polarity of this one because limit switch two, we want it to go down until limit switch two is operated, right? So if I try to run it right now, download it, 
and run this thing, um, if I press the close button, you notice my motor down isn't working because limit switch two isn't operated, right? It's not being held by the door, so it's not operating. We wanted the opposite polarity on this. And you had the same problem when you did this in, 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 your, uh, in your experiment. So now I'm gonna say, oh shoot, I want my limit switch two to be active low. So I'm gonna just change the symbol to an XIO, right? Now we'll download it and run that sucker. And now, good, limit switch two is now closed. So I can press the close button. Oh, I'm sealing on motor up instead of motor down. So I forgot to change that. So we're gonna go back to program mode. Gonna change this output to output one. And it knows output one is motor down because I defined it as motor down here. So it rewrote it there. Download it, run it, and uh, press close. And there she goes. Okay. I'm going to turn off the sound, and I'm going to turn off Merlin, and I'm going to turn off the screensaver. And there's a way of speeding it up. Um, how was that? Anyways, so you'll press close. And there it is going down. Right? Okay, so uh, that was super easy. I did the one instruction and then I copied it for the second run because it's pretty much the same look and then I just changed all the inputs and outputs. So motor up, motor down works now. Um, what do I want to do now? Let's say the, uh, the ajar light. Okay, let's do the ajar light. So the ajar light is going to be uh, limit switch one is operated and not limit switch two. That's when it's ajar, right? When limit switch one is operated and not limit switch two. So I'm going to go program mode. I'm going to add a new rung. Go offline. I'm going to add a new rung on the bottom here. I'm going to put in a, a XIO and an XIC and another coil, right? Wow, well, I missed it. I have to drag it to that little drop is over there. And I'm going to call this one, that's limit switch one. So I'm going to just drag limit switch one's address over to that contact, take the short way out. And I'm going to take my limit switch two and I'm going to drag its address over to the contact limit switch two, and I'm gonna take the open light, which is output two dash three, and I'm gonna drag it over to this coil, like that, right? So if limit switch one is operated and not limit switch two, it's a jar. Go online, download it to the PLC, put it in run mode, and we'll press open, and bang, limit switch one is true, and limit switch two is true, so the output two dash three, which is my jar light, is true. Oh, I, I got the wrong one. I used output two slash three, which is the open light, right? Oops, I can see that, so I'm gonna stop it. I'm gonna go to output two dash two instead, and I'm gonna label it, edit symbol, a jar light. Anything that makes, makes it work. I'm going to download that and run it there. So you can see it opening and the ajar light is on because LS1 and LS2 are both true here, right? And when it gets to the top, bing, ajar light turns off, right? Does that kind of make sense to you guys? Yeah, that makes sense. Yep, and super easy, super easy. Because all of the logic that I had to do before is just done on the, on the ladder logic up here. I don't have to wire switches in parallel and series and have this waterfall of wires coming off my, on my switch boxes, right? All I gotta do is take my, my open push button, my close push button and my stop push button and tie them into inputs and my motor up and motor down, tie them into outputs. And I'm done.
right? And this thing, this thing is ready to go, right? So that's kind of an example of uh, how easy it is to program this. Uh, now that you've got it, you got it working. The open light, I can, I can, I can do my open light and shut light too. So let's see now. Uh, the open light, open pilot light is going to be uh, when LS1 opens, right? The open pilot light, um, I'll just call it open, is going to be when LS1 is off. Close pilot light is going to be when LS2 is operated. Do you agree? Those are the Boolean equations for those guys. Program, go offline, put a new rung on there, put two new rungs on there. Um, I'm gonna put some outputs on there. I'm gonna put two outputs on there, one on each one. And I'm gonna call, let me just, uh, yeah, I can't get rid of that thing by itself. Or oh, yes, I can, I got the eraser. Let me get rid of this. So you can see my beautiful program. <laughs> All right. So I'm gonna put my open light, output two, pin three, I'm gonna put it over there. And I'm gonna put my shut light over here, output two, four, and I'm gonna call that shut lamp. And I'm gonna call this one, rename, 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 edit symbol. Open lamp and I'm gonna put in my my shut lamp is LS2 so I'm gonna put this here and I'm gonna give it the address of LS2 which is input one bit four and it already says LS2 because I already defined it up here up in the top so it already knew it was LS2 and normally close uh, would be my LS1 which is my input one bit three. And it already knows input one bit three is LS1 because I, again, I defined it up at the top and now I've set up my open and my shut lamps. Download to the PLC. Go off, go online and run the program. And now it's, the open light is on because the thing is open. I'll press the close button, click. And now the ajar light is on because it's closed, they're closing. And in a few moments, I think I can change the speed of it with this. Yes, <laughs> that's the slider. So now it's shut. I press open. It's ajar. And now it's open. All right. So minutes. You can do the whole garage door thing in minutes. So anytime you guys want to bet some money on whether I can program it faster than you can wire it up, I'd be happy to take that bet. Now, does anybody have any questions about the, any, anything about this programming or the algorithms or the, the XIC and XIOs, how they work? Not right now, but just <laughs> wait two weeks until we get to the lab and then I will, I'm sure I'll have several. Yeah. I bet you, honestly, I bet you that first time doing it, you'd be able to wire it all up before I could finish programming, programming it. That is a bet I'd be willing to take well. so, Yep. And what we're going to do in the lab, when I get you to the lab, is I'm going to show you the PLC. Show the PLC. I'm going to show you how you hook, how you hook the, in this case, it's a serial cable. You can program this through Ethernet to how you hook the serial cable into your computer, right? Then we're going to go to the computer. We're going to uh, bring up Logix Pro. We're going to bring up, uh, sorry, MicroLogix. We're going to select the kind of PLC we have. We're going to select the PLC. We're going to select the communication path, which is COM1, COM2. And then we're just going to show you how to download and upload simple programs and how to interface it to a box. Some of you guys may have noticed a large, a large box that has a whole bunch of plugins in the top and the bottom. That's the interface for the PLC. So those banana plugs, there's a whole bunch, there's eight input banana plugs and eight output banana plugs that plug into your 
your circuits, your push buttons, right? And allow you to talk to the PLC. And we're gonna be using those to control our, uh, our garage door. Anyways, that's it. That's the last of the, the PLC uh, slide deck at this point. I don't think we have a second one up till now. So now it's gonna be a matter of you guys just programming. So what, what are we doing for time here? It's the 27th this week. So next week is the 4th and the 11th. So we have two classes left. So I, I propose, I, I really can't talk much more about PLCs. I could talk about PLCs all day, but I think we're done with PLCs. So the next class, I wanna to talk to you about industrial robotics. And I wanna save our last class as kind of a, it can be a review and getting ready for the final exam and those kind of things, right? How does that sound? That sounds good. Okay, good. And the PLCs, yeah, we can we can do all the PLC labs in in one in one six hour block, so we'll have no problem getting those done. All right. Anybody have any? I can see my three D printing is all done. I love this one. My latest 3D print, thanks to my magic of Prusa, the parts just pop right off. Wonderful. Well, that was literally you making it. I thought that was a video on YouTube. Uh, nope, that was literally me. I had it printing while I was oh like, my gosh, I was so confused. <laughs> I, I live to confuse you guys. Huh? No, that was, I was just doing some 3D printing. I've got a, this is a, a robot kit and that's a chassis for it right there are we done like actual like in class notes for today yep okay yeah. and i just i had to print out a new chassis and wheels so uh that's what that is i'm gonna sign off then bye everyone all right i'm gonna sign off too anybody have any final yeah. questions before we let you go that's pretty cool what kind of 3d printer do you have i i looked at a lot of different kinds of 3d printers i'm gonna turn off recording because i don't want to sell anything here